All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Alan Javeri, Chief, Chief Operating Officer of the All India Professionals Congress. I now hand over to my colleague, mentor and friend, Salman Soz. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Alim. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Shashi, for joining us. Thank you to all the colleagues. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alim. Thank you for guiding us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you to our team for helping us uh, get to our first Clubhouse event, uh, a first for both uh, Shashi and for me. Uh, so it is a privilege. It is a pleasure. Uh, to be with all of you, and especially my friend Shashi Tharoor, who I must say just recently posted a video that I actually uh, personally was a little uh, concerned about because I'd been, you know, when Shashi got COVID in April, I'd been in touch with him. So we had seen uh, pretty bad days and uh, we were worried there for a bit. And then after all this time that uh, uh, po uh, when Shashi posted this video, um, uh, it really kind of... Uh, it really hit me and I kind of reached out to him and, uh, he, you know, so it's, it's, you can see that uh, COVID-19 can be a long battle for some people. So Shashi, tell us a little bit about your experience and what's been going on, because I'm sure many, many people in the country and perhaps around the world are worried about uh, what, what has happened uh, with you and tell us, give us a status check. Well, I'm, 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 I am can't say I'm fine, but I'm, I'm all right. I'm in the sense that uh, it could certainly be a lot worse. Um, the, uh, the thing is, I actually had been fully vaccinated, except that the second vaccination uh, was taken just a few days before symptoms of COVID appeared, and therefore perhaps it hadn't had a chance to have an effect on the system. Um, uh, my mother, 85 years old, uh, also got COVID. My uh, sister, who was visiting us from California, she'd had two Pfizer shots, she got COVID. So... Uh, we learned very quickly that vaccinations do not preclude your getting COVID, but of course, in principle, they mean that you would normally get a milder case. The classic COVID symptoms for all of us were indeed manageable. Uh, they were uh, the cold, cough, sore throat, slight fever, the, the kind of flu symptoms that many people uh, are familiar with. And in all our cases, it didn't descend to the lungs. In my case, however, the complication that arose was something called COVID-induced viral myocarditis, where the, the COVID virus inflames the, uh, the conduction system of the heart uh, and then starts playing havoc with heartbeat. So I wake up in the morning with a 32 heartbeat or a 33, and then two hours later, fortunately, went up again to normal territory, but it plunged again. Unpredictably, there was a certain arrhythmia um, I ended up uh, having to spend 24 hours in the ICU, and then I said, look, I don't really want to use a bed um, that, that uh, there's so much demand for in Delhi at that time. Uh, and so I, I was monitored at home instead with a device strapped to my chest. Um, the unpredictability of the heartbeat issue continues, but the bigger problem now, uh, a month and a half into my, into my illness, is exhaustion. I'm terribly, deeply fatigued. And that's the thing that uh, uh, is difficult to explain to people because, you know, you can sympathize with somebody with a broken leg, but somebody who's just so exhausted that he can barely sit up in bed is difficult to, to fully grasp what's going on with them. Um, all I can say is that um, there are ups and downs. There are moments when one is really exhausted and moments when one finds the energy this is a bit of a risk, this experiment. Will I be able to stay seated and intelligible and, and converse with you all for an hour? I'm going to give it a try, but that's where we stand right now. Uh, so that's the, that's the quick and detailed summary uh, of my situation. Samar. I think uh, you will be able to uh, sustain because, you know, throughout your illness, you have been uh, active, you have been writing, uh, you've been sharing your ideas. Uh, you've uh, been on social media. I mean, obviously, uh, your views are uh, heard uh, around the country. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's good to see you active, despite the fact that you're, you are exhausted a lot. And uh, uh, I, I feel sorry about that. But I, I know 
uh, inshallah, you'll you'll be fine, and it may take a little time, but uh, I I expect full recovery. But now, t- talking about uh, your illness, and of course, I, I did. My parents uh, also got COVID. We had five members in our household who uh, got COVID. Uh, my parents were vaccinated, uh, and you were vaccinated. Your mother and sister were vaccinated. Of course, we can't really tell exactly if the vaccines uh, really help, but I think, to my mind, I think they help my parents. But today, Prashant Bhushan uh, tweeted out uh, 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 some uh, article, uh, uh, some study by 57 scientists talking about how this was uh, vaccines are bad. Uh, there's not enough science behind them. Meanwhile, the overwhelming consensus in the scientific and medical community is that these are safe and effective, especially the you know at least the ones that are approved. What do you say uh, about uh, uh, about such studies and uh, you know, Prashant Bhushan is an influencer. Uh, the, the, can this create vaccine hesitancy in India? Well, I hope not, because I think the, the, the wager that we are really placing on this is that it may be that we can still catch COVID with a vaccine. And as you said, we have had that experience. But it's also, we don't know how much worse it would have been if we hadn't been vaccinated. And the truth is that the number of really bad cases um, after vaccination is relatively low by comparison with the number of very bad cases of people who have not been vaccinated. So on balance, I think, uh, you know, if you've got something that may help you, uh, what do you have to lose? Take the vaccination and hope that um, it, it blocks whatever it is that the virus is attempting to do to you. Uh, I do want to say that um, in my case, I seem to have been a bit unlucky with one particular complication, but who knows what else uh, could have gone wrong. And I'm very grateful that I am vaccinated and I, I would urge others to also uh, you know, take this cautionary lesson. I have an 85 year old mother. I have, I have a you know, family who were obviously beside themselves with worry when she got it. And she ended up with a relatively mild case. Um, which, to my mind, must be to some degree because she was vaccinated. Yeah, you know, thank God for vaccines as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, vaccines. Let's talk about the second wave a little bit because uh, uh, I had my own questions, but we got some questions from our AIPC colleagues as well. And uh, their question, uh, so there's uh, Pratik and Venkatesh, Manoj, Rajesh Varan and Ashwani. Uh, they basically uh, say that, look, uh, the, uh, uh, there is criticism that the government uh, uh, exported vaccines when we needed them here. But we also need uh, to show the world that uh, India is, uh, is a power that kind of uh, helps out other countries. How do you strike a balance? Did the government of India, as far as vaccine policy is concerned, uh, did the government of D- India do its job the way it should have been done? And uh, uh, so, uh, this question is going to come to a separate related question, which is going to be a little tougher. Okay, well, on the vaccine front, let me just say that I, I think that it's very clear that the government uh, fell into a trap of complacency. Uh, it was reflected in the Prime Minister's speech in Davos in January, where he essentially congratulated himself and his government for having saved not just Indians, but the world from the consequence of the severe uh, Indian infection. But as we later discovered, he had not bothered to order anything more than 11 million vaccines for a population of 1.34 billion people. That's that's calamitous, to put it mildly. And I think that had we all realized that, certainly I, for example, uh, who applauded embarrassingly publicly, the government's vaccine metri program under which it was exporting vaccines abroad, uh, I, would have, I would have thought twice about doing that. Had the government, like the governments of the US, the UK, the European Union, which all actually um, ordered vaccines going back to August of last year and therefore have their supplies for their people at this time, uh, had our government done something like that, given money in advance, in particular to the two Indian manufacturers, um, and scaled up production, 
we would not have been in this ridiculous situation where a policy to give vaccines to people between 18 and 45 was announced at the very time that vaccines were running out in vaccination centers for the rest of the people. So uh, it, was a, it was a tragic situation. Uh, by April, only 37% of our healthcare workers, uh, barely 1.3% of our population had been fully vaccinated. And only 8% had one vaccine shot. So it really was a dreadful situation. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I wonder, uh, it's, it's sometimes you want to pull your hair out because, uh, uh, I, I, you know, we're going to talk about the economy because that's a field that I can uh, focus on. But, uh, you know, I, I really uh, sometimes have, you know, I'm angry sometimes about uh, what has happened in India. I, I think a lot of this, Shashi, is driven by, I think it is somehow about image. Rep, you know, somehow you have to look larger than uh, what you really are. And I think it starts with the prime minister. And, you know, uh, we, we've we been very critical of the government, of course, for good reason. We have dead bodies floating in, uh, in reverse in the 21st century. Of course, we are angry. Of well, course, we are upset. Well, of no, course, no. people are angry. But, you know, the thing about this image business, image is always a reflection of actual performance. Um, you know, no one gets an image only because of press releases uh, or, 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 or good speeches or good photo ops. It's when they point to concrete performance that image actually has an impact, especially when it comes to people abroad who have no other uh, skill in the game, who just have, if you like, a, a, a perception of what the country is all about. And there, had the government done what other governments have done and, and ordered early enough, had they also, for example, not out of misplaced vaccine nationalism refused to grant um, emergency use approval to vaccines from abroad. So had we also had imported vaccines, perhaps for the more affluent, um, more manufacturing of vaccines, more money from the central government to our Indian manufacturers, and large quantities being churned out, then India could have both protected its people and exported under vaccine metry. And had we done that, our image would certainly have been wonderful around the world, as it very briefly was. I would say from January to the end of February, middle of March, we had a great image where prime ministers of small countries sending messages thanking uh, India and the Indian prime minister for having sent vaccines to them. Uh, there was the president of Brazil, I think, uh, issuing a tweet showing India as Hanuman bringing the Sanjeevani. Uh, to, to Brazil. So all of this is wonderful for image. But the moment it became apparent that India actually didn't have vaccines uh, for its own people, that India was getting into a crisis, and when that crisis occurred, that the government was struggling to mobilize doctors, nurses, testing kits, personal protective equipment, hospital beds, ventilators, oxygen cylinders, medicines, and of course, vaccines, then obviously our image could not possibly survive such a realization. And when people realize this around the world, even before the horrific images of the bodies floating down the Ganga, very clearly uh, the, the, the national image had taken a terrible beating. And then all the hollow claims, including some of the, the boastful ones made in Davos in January and then the celebration of those things we sent out, vaccines we sent to foreign countries, that looked very hollow, especially when we abruptly stopped even contractual commitments to export vaccines, because obviously we didn't have enough, enough vaccines for our own people. So it really was a major botch up, and inevitably our image has suffered around the world. So, so, uh, so I, I agree with you, of course, and not because uh, not because uh, uh, we're on the same side or we're friends. But you know, I I, uh, I I fully agree with you. But the question is, how does it make you feel? As uh, you know, you've been uh, in the UN for so many years at such a senior level, uh, a diplomat. How does it make you feel uh, when uh, uh, former ambassadors, a group of former ambassadors, uh, Indian ambassadors? write an op-ed piece in the Indian Express 
uh, basically outlining, of course, many things which are right about, you know, the government is continuing certain policies of uh, the UPA government, et cetera, et cetera, and taking, you know, obviously building on that. But it seemed to me the undercurrent of that piece was uh, there is a toolkit gang and lobby that we are obviously part of uh, who are out to destroy uh, Modi's image. Uh, what is what what does it say about what has happened to people in India? Or these types of people. First of all, I don't think he needs any help destroying his image internationally. He's doing a very good job of it himself. Uh, uh, so, so I think that's that charge is somewhat misplaced. Um, look, let me be very honest and say that every Indian uh, feels good when our country comes across in a positive light. When we are abroad, when we travel internationally, uh, whether it's a an Indian cricket victory, whether it's a a success story in managing a drought or, or dealing with a cyclone or a success story uh, in handling a pandemic, obviously all Indians feel proud. We feel uh, that, that, you know, we are by association uh, happy to partake in this pride in our success. So I don't think anyone, any Indian going to rejoice at the idea that we are really being spoken of with a certain amount of contempt, a certain amount of criticism. And no one is happy about it. But as a responsible opposition in a functioning democracy, inevitably we do have to articulate as opposition the voices and the anguish of people who are terribly frustrated. We're not doing it to tarnish Mr. Modi's image. We're doing it to give voice to the victims within our own country, within our own democratic political system. And that is something which, of course, we have to do. And if in the process, some of those sounds are also heard abroad, that's in the nature of modern communications, and that's in the nature of modern democracy. Uh, they'll just have to lump it. I'm sorry to say that uh, when Mr. Modi, even after becoming prime minister, has said things like, you know, until he became prime minister, no Indian could hold their head up abroad and so on. Um, you know, we squirmed uh, because obviously we didn't think it was an accurate reflection at all of what, um, of what uh, the reality of India had been. But nonetheless, this is what he has spoken. So I think given that we have a government that has set a rather undesirable precedent of taking political differences abroad, um, it ill behooves these retired diplomats uh, to, to criticize uh, Indian political parties for doing their job. And, and not just criticize Indian political parties. They had, uh, you know, uh, they had not one word of empathy for those who died, uh, who have died during this crisis. Not one word, which uh, to my mind is shocking and uh, tells, uh, to, uh, says a little bit about the character of uh, such people, I'm sorry to say. But because they brought an image because the image is so, it seems to be so uh, 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 top of the agenda for uh, uh, this government and its supporters. Tell me a little bit about your time in the UN and how was India coming along those days uh, when you were in the UN and you were almost at the cusp of moving to, you know, after you ran for the secretary generalship and uh, actually came in second, I think. And uh, and uh, how was India viewed those days? And then uh, you came to India, obviously, because you were attracted. Obviously, you're you're a great patriot, but at the same time, you moved here because you felt you could do more. And uh, so, tell us tell us a little bit about the India's image those days, and how uh, yeah. after after uh, uh, Nigeria just banned Twitter, and how Delhi police went into Twitter. What's going on? What's the where do we where, where are we now? Yeah, I mean, I must say that uh, when you look at what uh, what uh, India was in those days, it really was quite a star country uh, at all sorts of levels. In fact, um, uh, there'd been this phenomenal success at Davos when India had sold itself to the world as the world's largest, fastest growing free market democracy. Uh, and that was obviously a very pointed contrast to China which was perhaps growing faster and was larger, but was no democracy. Uh, and, and India had this luster of being both a success story 
and a country that had very successfully managed its diversity and the diversity uh, of the people uh, of the country. So all of this, to my mind, was, was a huge, huge success. Uh, secondly, uh, we had the uh, rather benign public image of the Indian government. I mean, no one would have described a uh, gentle, uh, consensual Prime Minister Manmohan Singh as uh, any sort of autocrat, unlike the kind of image Mr. Modi now has, which is unfortunately for him and for India, clubbing him with the likes of Bolsonaro in Brazil and Erdogan in Turkey and, and Trump indeed when he was there in the US and so on, as sort of right-wing, autocratic, hyper-nationalistic, chauvinistic figures. Uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh had a very benign image, by, uh, particularly by comparison, but even in absolute terms. Uh, I would say that the Indian government uh, had a terrific uh, worldwide image as a uh, fast-growing free market democracy, uh, that it had uh, at the same time a very benign image for its management of diversity at home and for the consensual politics of its prime minister, so in many ways, we had a very, very um, different standing in the world at that time uh, when I uh, left the United Nations and came back to India to contest the elections of 2009. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I was struck by because I joined the Ministry of External Affairs after winning my seat was that uh, they were dealing with the unprecedented crisis of a larger number of heads of state and government seeking invitations to visit India than they actually had the bandwidth to accommodate. They literally couldn't find enough you know, protocol and enough spaces in the calendar of the president or the vice president or the prime minister to be able to receive all the people who wanted to come. That was how well India was doing. So obviously, we've come a long way down in the decade, uh, a dozen years since then. And I wonder, I wonder if it starts uh, with, uh, you know, you spoke about uh, two prime ministers. I wonder if it has something to do with the fact uh, that uh, maybe Prime Minister Modi doesn't, uh, you know, maybe people are afraid to speak up in front of him. Maybe, I mean, why else would he do demonetization? Why else would, uh, would uh, he go through, a, 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 basically he's, you know, run the, the country into the ground through this vaccine kind of policy and, uh, total mismanagement, you know, uh, hubris. Tell me about your time with Dr. Singh. I mean, uh, you were his uh, minister. You'd come from the UN. You were uh, almost the secretary general of uh, the UN. And uh, then you were in this. Did you ever feel that you could not say something in front of him? That, that uh, you Oh, no. I mean, that, that, was, that was the most wonderful thing was that I, I actually didn't see any uh, real difference in the... Uh, in the freedoms that one has in the international environment to speak to one's superiors and the freedoms I found when I came into, into the government of India. In fact, what was interesting about Dr. Singh was not only that one could speak to him when one was in a meeting with him, but he would often call. I mean, at least once a month, I would get a call to just come over to the prime minister's office. And he would ask me, so what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? He actually wanted to know people's views. And that was the most uh, satisfactory and I must say admirable thing uh, in, in dealing with uh, a man of that quality. In other words, you don't have somebody who believes he knows all the answers, or even if he knows all the answers, he believes that he can gain from hearing other points of view. So uh, that's far from what we've seen, as you mentioned, with the demonetization. Uh, all the evidence, all the information, all the published sources say that it was undertaken with neither the finance minister nor the chief economic advisor in the loop. So uh, demonetization was announced and the two principal individuals responsible for economic policy were kept in the dark before the announcement was made. Now, that's not a serious way of running a professional government. Uh, similarly, the lockdown when COVID happened last year was announced at a little, over, a little under four hours notice without consulting any of the state governments, which in our federal system was a, a, a complete anomaly, and without giving any notice to anybody, so the announcement was made in such a way that, for example, employers who might, with enough notice, have been able to make arrangements for the migrant labor they were employing, could not, because everything was locked down, they couldn't reach these laborers, the laborers couldn't reach them. 
and they were essentially left to fend for themselves. And we saw the huge human tragedy of the millions of migrant laborers trudging home after that. So all of this is a direct result of a style that completely eschews consultation and that absolutely steers clear of consensus or cooperative management. That is a genuine problem. Yeah, and it is a problem that has actually uh, uh, created, uh, to my mind, uh, an economic crisis that, frankly, after demonetization, I never thought India would uh, would uh, you know have a worse crisis. And uh, uh, and I, I think I want to get to a question that some of our uh, AIPC fellows had asked. This is uh, Purika, Abhijit, and Rajesh. They basically said that economists are of the view that India is going to have a U-shaped recovery. Uh, and uh, uh, and there's uh, you know the share market seems to be doing well, but overall we see uh, uh, economic devastation. Uh, you know that the economy has contracted by 7.3 percent. But I want to tell everybody who's listening to us that 7.3 percent is based on what uh, they know as in the formal uh, sector, the informal economy, which is a huge part of the Indian economy. We really don't have a good sense of how things are, but uh, most people think that things have gone horribly wrong and that uh, there, are, uh, there is a study which said that 97% of Indians have actually uh, lost income. Uh, there's another report which talks about almost 200, over 200 million people have fallen into poverty, much greater numbers than, uh, than even the World Bank had predicted just last year. Now, uh, what, what, what is your sense of, of, of what this devastation means for India's uh, future? Uh, because, because this is going to be, uh, I think, a big, big challenge uh, for us in the, in, the, in the coming years. Salman, you're our economist, and you can give a better answer to that than I can. But common sense tells me that this is really going to hurt ordinary Indians terribly. We already have the worst unemployment levels ever recorded, which uh, means that there are uh, people out of work. And, and, and I'm reading figures that say that perhaps... Uh, a couple of hundred million people may have slipped into poverty who had pulled themselves out of poverty in the course of the last uh, uh, decade or so. So it's really a horrendous development. Uh, the concern that many of us would have would not just be about macroeconomic numbers, and those are obviously very revealing, but about the tangible impact this will have on human beings, on our fellow citizens and their ability to, to, to live decent lives, bring up families and hope for the future. So to my mind, it's, it's really calamitous. But as an economist, why don't you tell everyone who's listening a little more about the implications of what you've just raised yourself? You know, I, uh, I've been thinking about these issues for some years now. In fact, I'm writing a book right now about, uh, 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 you know, uh, India's post-pandemic economy and what we can do. But you know the real uh, the real uh, worry is that uh, even before you know frankly even before the pandemic hit India's uh, 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 economic trajectory was you know uh, we were stagnating uh, and actually uh, going down slowly and I think that was a worry so we entered the crisis uh, fairly weak and that weakness I personally think had a lot to do with demonetization. So when you go into a crisis, which is like this kind of crisis, you know, uh, it reminds me of uh, the global financial crisis uh, when it hit in 2008. Uh, there's a Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis. Uh, they, they did a study which basically indicated that the output of the United States in 2018 compared to its trend, pre-crisis trend, where it would have been, the economy, the U.S. economy was much smaller than it would have been had that crisis not struck. Now, remember, that was a financial crisis. So banking sector and other things. This crisis is different. This is a generalized crisis. So India was already weak, you know, going into the crisis. And you can ask the government why the economy was doing badly, because I think we know uh, why. And then this crisis hit. And this is a generalized crisis. That was the first wave, lockdown. And then came the second wave. I'm afraid that... Uh, uh, recovery, uh, you know, people talk in terms of general, you know, U-shaped, V-shaped, K-shaped, whatever. But I think, uh, 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 I don't think people fully understand that we are going to not recover to pre-pandemic pre, pre -pandemic, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, trends or trajectory for at least a decade longer. And might I add, for that, you need the kinds of policies, you need quick work. There are, you know, and there's tons of literature from all over which talks about how you got to deal, deal with the crisis very quickly, firmly, decisively. We can't get into a situation where you don't have vaccines, for example, for a crisis like this. So I, I, I think that the best case scenario would be having a government. We need a government, a necessary condition is a reasonable, sensible, policy-driven, uh, uh, evidence-based, ev evidence-driven government that can actually take some measures that will stop the bleeding and then start kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, building this economy back up. It will be a long, long path to recovery. I might as well say this now, and I'm writing about this. I personally think that uh, the UPA era trajectory I don't think we'll see in our lifetime, unfortunately. Even if, mm. even if you have a good government in place, unfortunately, I think that is that is the kind of devastation we're looking at. I don't think people fully understand it right now. I think people are very immersed with COVID nineteen and the vaccines and all the stuff, but the kind of devastation I I fear uh, is going to be. I mean, just, if you look at these numbers of two hundred million people having fallen back into poverty, we always knew they were vulnerable to falling back into poverty, but it actually happened according to uh, this report. And I have no reason to not believe this report because we've seen what's happened uh, to the country. Uh, so unfortunately it's gonna be, uh, it's, we are in a very, very bad way, but a necessary condition for India's recovery is a good government, a sensible government a government that mm. does hard work and, and, and be, uh, follows policy and follows advice, follows uh, advice of experts and evidence. And, you know, and there's a lot to learn from other countries. Uh, unfortunately, I feel that, uh, uh, and this is, I'm not making a political point. I belong to the Congress party. Yes, uh, I may be partisan in that sense, but I also care deeply about what happens to our people. And I fear uh, uh, a necessary condition is that we need a government. This government is not going to do, do, do uh, I don't think this government is capable of doing it. You know, once you cross 30, your uh, habits are set. Mr. Modi is not going to change at this age. He is who he is. I don't think he is the right person uh, to uh, take us uh, through a, re a recovery process, but I don't want to make it too political. So let's get on, get on that part. But the economy is not doing well, and uh, we need to put more pressure on the government to kind of, you know, they, they, you know, people are going to die of starvation. I'm telling you, people are going to go hungry in this country. Our children, our children are going to be stunted more than they have been, and they have been for a long time stunted and all that. So I think we need to take some uh, steps uh, quickly, decisively to, you know, move this country out of this mess. Uh, and nothing will work without vaccines. A vaccine policy right now, which is terrible vaccine policy. I just saw an ad, uh, sorry, a short uh, thing on Twitter where big hospitals had uh, had lacks and lacks of uh, vaccine doses. I think it's a travesty. It's a slap in the face of uh, poor Indian people who cannot afford a vaccine that uh, some people are jumping uh, the queue. It is, it is an abhorrent thing. Uh, I condemn it. Uh, wholeheartedly. I, I just wish people would just wake up and say, we cannot accept this anymore. This is just, I'm just so, so angry, you can tell. Anyway, um, um, let, let's get to something else, Shashi, and uh, yeah. that is that is about you now. You know, we, we've talked about the economy, we talked about a bit of foreign policy, we talked about uh, uh, COVID-19. Tell me a little bit about uh, where you go from here. You've been a three-time winner uh, of Lok Sabha elections, some uh, during some difficult times, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know the elections are coming up in twenty nine, uh, two thousand twenty four. But you know, you are vilified by uh, uh, your opponents. Uh, you're abused by uh, a, a huge troll army. Uh, I would, I dare say, that some people who uh, are our friends may also not like you. You know, uh, in the sense that, you know, uh, there is some level of, uh, you know, Shashi Tharoor, you know, what an image and all that stuff. And, you know, we, you know, you, you're such a presence. Do you not sometimes say, you know what, I don't know how to do this. 
you could just go, you could write, you could do speaking engagements, you could travel the world, you could uh, lead think tanks. Uh, there'd be so much demand for someone like you. What makes you what makes you keep on doing what you're doing? Because I know you love what you're doing, uh, despite everything. Tell us why. Why, Shashi? Thanks, Emma. Well, I don't always love what I'm doing, but I do feel uh, one strong motivation, and that is to make a difference. I mean, I've uh, somehow from childhood always had this feeling that if one has to have um, any purpose to existing on this planet, it can only lie in making a difference in the lives of others, in making an impact on your surroundings, and therefore in giving meaning uh, to others through everything that you do, write, think, say. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do all my life. When I chose to come back to India, I had very comfortable options, the ones you mentioned, relax in a comfortable environment, make enough money, write, uh, speak. I was getting $50,000 a speech already in those days on the speaking circuit in the States. Uh, half a dozen speeches would have put me very comfortably off. But I, I just felt that had never been my motivation. Money or comfort was not the bottom line. I really wanted to see how I could, as I once perhaps immodestly said, India matters to me and I want to matter to India. And, and in the same spirit, I wanted to come and, and see how I could help and make a difference. I was uh, confident that with my experience, my knowledge for what it's worth, uh, that I could make a contribution uh, given the opportunity, but I knew I had to earn the opportunity of going to the people and winning their trust and winning their votes. Uh, when I was able to do that, um, I felt that was my mission, that was my calling. And uh, it wasn't always easy. Uh, I've had two resounding victories and one very, very close squeaker of an election win. But that's politics. And the truth is that um, you know that uh, uh, there's no guarantees at any time. You can't take the voters for granted. But you also know that in the trust they have given you, uh, you have actually um, uh, achieved something that's very precious and valuable that's given only to a few and that therefore must be guarded with a great deal of sensitivity and care. So, yes, I, I, I have my frustrations. I have my problems. I am certainly... Uh, not enjoying uh, a lot of the abuse and vilification that you mentioned. Uh, but at the end of the day, I try not to lose sight of the larger goal, which is to make an impact in creating a better India. I recognize that uh, success is far from guaranteed and that certainly there are severe limitations to how much we can accomplish in the opposition. Uh, but at the same time, I've always believed that the country comes first and, 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 and politics and everything else comes second. And I will do my very best to speak out for and stand up for the right things for the country, whether or not that happens to suit me politically. And, uh, you know, because you talked about uh, uh, being in opposition and obviously the other side of uh, that, uh, that uh, is being uh, uh, able to get back uh, to governance and mm -hmm. being able to govern and winning. Uh, now, uh, we have some uh, questions from our fellows, uh, and uh, I'll summarize them. So uh, it's Sanjeev and uh, Dr. Chandra, Santosh, and Nicho. Uh, and also, uh, these are related questions. So I'm going to mention uh, these other people. Franklin, Darbender, Abdul, Abadan, Shurish, Madhusudan, Chintan, and Rakesh. This is about the Congress Party. This is about the Congress okay. Party. And... Uh, it's about the BJP and the Congress Party. So the BJP, clearly, there is an ideology at play. Uh, they, talk, they talk about abolishing Article 370, Triple Talaq Law, Ram Temple, uh, these kinds of issues. Um, uh, meanwhile, uh, and of course, they would, uh, they, 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 in 2014, they married that with uh, uh, economic development rhetoric, which uh, they have totally failed on, but uh, that is their ideology. Uh, what does the, you know, the Congress Party, uh, you know, I think uh, the Congress Party seems to, uh, at least people don't have a sense of where the Congress Party stands. Where is, what is the ideology going to be going forward? Uh, you know, uh, what is the 21st century Congress Party about? Well, if I had to summarize it in two words, it would be inclusive India. I think uh, by, by, by that, I, I don't just mean inclusion in the economic sense that you as an economist are familiar with, but that's very important. 
making sure that nobody is left out of India's economic growth and prosperity. But it's also inclusive in the social sense, in the religious sense. We have a government right now which is dividing us as a society and as a nation, uh, which is unfortunately encouraging people to identify themselves as us and them, whereas for the Congress Party, all Indians are us. We are together in this, and we want to see everyone of every background flourish. Uh, I would say that um, finding India uh, a, a sensible place in the world, improving the well-being of the masses, uh, particularly those who have actually been stuck below the poverty line or have been pushed back under it by recent developments, all of that is a very high priority for the Congress Party. Keeping India together and not divided by religion, caste, region, language, and so on is another major priority. So we stand for inclusive India. And um, I think that we have done a reasonably good job of proving that during our opportunities in government, uh, which, of course, we haven't had for some years now. Now, Shashi, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's take this a little forward, a little, you know, uh, push this a little bit more. Because, uh, okay, there, I, I sense in India there is a lot of anger with how uh, 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 the government, the central government and other governments uh, may have uh, performed during this time. Uh, I think people realize that uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, th there are going to be a lot of challenges. And uh, the question really many people are asking is, OK, fine, uh, may maybe the uh, BJP has failed. And uh, it's a colossal failure, I think. But be OK, fine, given that uh, the BJP as well. What exactly would the Congress do differently? Uh, how would Congress get India out of this crisis and get uh, India back on the path to uh, recovery? What is it that you would uh, do differently? What are some of the key things? I mean, of Everything. Course, I, I mean, too. honestly, I think both what the policies we'd follow and the way in which we do them would be very different, Salman. I mean, certainly the Congress Party respects expertise and would turn to experts. Uh, uh, I can see that many of the, the, the country's foremost economists, for example, have been speaking out quite critically of what's been happening under Mr. Modi. And I can be quite certain that they would be given an opportunity to guide uh, a Congress Party policy. So we would respect expertise. Um, but if you want to take very concrete specifics on the COVID crisis, for example, we had talked throughout of taking proactive measures when, the, uh, when COVID was first beginning. We had talked about a lockdown, but with adequate notice. We had talked about a safety net for those affected. We had talked about a fiscal stimulus that was a serious stimulus and not, I'm afraid, a smoke and mirror stimulus is the one we got. Um, we talked about help for small businesses so they could keep their people employed. We talked about a serious moratorium on both loans and interest. We'd had some very, very specific policy suggestions, which obviously would have been what we would have done had we been in government uh, at the time. Um, and the way we would have done, we would certainly not have uh, plunged the economy into the uncertainty of demonetization. We would certainly not have pretended that uh, after the Chinese had killed 20 of our soldiers, that quote unquote, no one has intruded, uh, uh, as the prime minister said, we would, we would have had a number of major differences in terms of our policy approaches right across the board, whether on foreign policy, whether on uh, vaccine management, whether on uh, lockdown announcements. And of course, one of the key things we believe in very strongly is in empowering the states, but to only where they have the resources to be able to do it. The central government today has disempowered the states, taken decisions riding roughshod over them, uh, and at the same time then shuffled problems off onto them without giving them any additional money to deal with them. So vaccines are a classic example. The central, central government, the present central government says, we have negotiated a price for us for the vaccines we will buy, which will be for people above 45. And as far as we are concerned, uh, the state governments can go off and bargain by themselves uh, to do what needs to be done and actually come up with, um, with um, uh, buying vaccines, negotiating with suppliers, 
and vaccinating people. That's the kind of situation that we find ourselves in. And the Congress Party would not do that. We'd only give the states responsibilities with resources. Is that your mom asking you for uh, for something? It was indeed, Salman. You were a cute, a cute <laughs> pair of eyes. That's why I suddenly faltered towards the end of that answer. But um, anyway... Uh, uh, Ali, uh, I know we've gone past uh, one hour, but do we yeah. have a few more minutes? I have a few yeah. more questions to ask. So the thing is, uh, first and foremost, to all our listeners and viewers, uh, we apologize unequivocally for the technical issues we have faced. We've never attempted to do this before. We are really sorry. Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, Dr. Tharoor, if you are okay health-wise, we know you're recovering. Would you be willing to take uh, a few more questions, say, till the end of the hour, another 10, 15 minutes? It would go another, ten, for another 10 minutes or so would be about it. Okay. Would, 10 minutes. Wonderful. Uh, we also, uh, to answer the last couple of questions. Sure. We also have, uh, uh, we've also got quite a few listeners on uh, Clubhouse. For those of us, uh, those who are on Twitter, AIPC is broadcasting Dr. Thuru, just in case you're wondering where he is. He is there on Twitter, but via the AIPC. So please don't be worried. Thank you again. Uh, let's continue. Okay. So, uh, you know, um, uh, I think the kinds of things you've said, they're very sensible. And, uh, you know, I sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, I kind of, uh, it's unbelievable what's happening in India. As somebody who's a student of economics, I look at things like, why are they doing this? Uh, what, what is going on in their minds? Why, why are they subjecting India to this? But anyway, but, you know, I, I, uh, I want to make a slight digression before coming back to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the you talk about China. And China uh, uh, is, uh, you know, obviously, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, is, is a rival. Uh, um, but China seems to be more a rival of the United States. Meanwhile, we uh, had other friendships besides the United, uh, you know, United States. We had Russia and others. But it seems to me that India's situation is very interesting, and I don't know what you think of it. I feel that um, uh, with the Democrats taking power in the United States and progressive Democrats being very vocal on issues of values, democracy and uh, personal freedom and rights and all that, uh, they, they may not see very kindly to take very kindly to what's happening in India. Meanwhile, India's erstwhile uh, good friend Russia seems to be uh, getting closer to China, and China is obviously taking on the United States, and China, after this particular crisis, is going to be far ahead. I, I think it's going to leap ahead of, uh, in, it was already way ahead. Uh, the per capita income was almost four or five times uh, India's per capita income. But after this crisis, given how they've dealt with it, they've all, you know, they, I think they're going to, there's going to be a separation, I think. Now they'll be uh, taking on the U.S. So, Strategically, what does India do? Uh, because India needs friends, because this is a very tough neighborhood. Yeah, no, we absolutely do need friends. I think that uh, uh, I'm not going to be criticizing the government for um, having cozied up to the quad, so-called, that is the, the emerging partnership uh, or the dialogue, as it prefer to call it, amongst the US, Australia, Japan, and India uh, in this region, because I think we needed to signal to the Chinese that they could not treat us with impunity, that we also have friends. But having said that, uh, we are a country that has always valued our strategic autonomy. And um, if we find ourselves essentially playing somebody else's agenda, uh, we have to ask ourselves, how does that help us? If, for example, the Chinese see us as part of an attempt to contain China uh, orchestrated out of Washington, um, which obviously would not be to our advantage. China is a next door neighbor, and we have very uh, extensive economic and other relationships with them, um, then, then we would be doing ourselves some harm. Equally, we have um, an Indo-Pacific concept, which is all very well and which is very important for keeping the sea lanes open and facilitating trade and commerce amongst the countries of the Indo-Pacific region. But that doesn't actually do anything for us in terms of our land troubles with the Chinese. Our problems with China are on the northern borders, and there we're on our own. There is no quad there to help us. So we need to have uh, a fairly sensible uh, and balanced approach 
uh, before we burn bridges entirely with others. Uh, the Russians are increasingly in the Chinese camp. Can we afford to tell the Russians off, as it were, uh, by uh, to turn the Russians off by going off and making common cause entirely with Washington? Obviously, we can't. Russia is a very major defense supplier for us still, for example. Um, uh, and so we, we do need to somehow keep everybody on board. And that's why, as I said, it's very easy to criticize from the outside. I've not been doing so. Uh, if anything, I have actually in my writings and statements internationally, I've been showing a lot of understanding for the Indian government stand on the Quad, the Indo-Pacific and the Northern borders. But I do think that, um, that what's important for us is to always bear in mind that the purpose of any Indian strategy ultimately has to come down to the well-being, the welfare, the prosperity and security of the Indian people. That's essentially what foreign policy is all about. It's about helping people here. It's not about playing games on some international chessboard uh, without regard to what's happening to the pawns back home. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is very complicated, I think. You know, uh, uh, I, I know we talk a lot about the U.S. We talk a lot, of, a lot about China and Russia. We don't talk enough about uh, the Europeans and how our, those relationships are going. And the, the Europeans are not going away. They're still a very powerful bloc. Uh, and I feel, I feel that uh, somehow they're not uh, as much in the discussion uh, when we talk about uh, these issues. But having said that, now let's get back to the future a little bit, Shashi. Uh, you took talked about uh, the kinds of things, uh, uh, you know, Congress would do and certainly the kinds of things that we would not do. Uh, do no harm is a, is a sensible policy. Don't do harm, uh, which somehow this uh, government seems to enjoy doing. Where do you see Indian politics over the next few years? Uh, what when you when you can if, uh, let's take your crystal ball and uh, let's do let's gaze a little bit and uh, what do you think is uh, going to happen over the course of the next uh, year or two? How is Indian politics going to evolve? Well, uh, we have 16 elections coming up from so states, and that's essentially going to be a series of referenda on how the government's functioning. In about six, seven months, UP, the largest prize of all, uh, faces the urn. And I must say that um, uh, these are going to be extremely important and worth watching for a number of trends. Obviously, how the BJP conducts itself, how well it does, is what the, the default question is. But there are other things. Will the opposition come together? For example, it's clear that in many states, um, Bengal having been the most recent example, the principal opposition to Mr. Modi and the BJP is coming from a regional party. In UP, there are two regional parties in the fray um, who in many ways are seen as being ahead of uh, the national opposition party, the Congress. In most of the other states uh, that are coming to the polls in the course of the next couple of years, um, the Congress is the principal player in opposition to the BJP. So in the 16 states, I think 13 are going to be a straight Congress BJP fight. So the Congress party, how it fares, how it organizes itself, how it gets moving, these are going to be very important things to watch in Indian politics in the next couple of years. We are in a somewhat anomalous position in the Congress party at the moment. Uh, our president step aside, we have an interim president, there's been some uh, desire to get some stable arrangements in place, uh, and certainly COVID has uh, frustrated any attempt at, at reorganizing any of these spaces. But one would think that that would also be an extremely important thing to pay attention to in, as you said, the time frame of your question for the next couple of years, that would be the other thing. So the emergence of strong regional parties, uh, a tendency for the opposition to coalesce, to come together and to cooperate in order to put a more or less united front against the BJP, and the Congress party getting its act together and demonstrating in a series of state elections that it is the viable alternative to the BJP. All of these, it seems to me, are the key uh, trends that we would actually have to watch out for. You know, uh, uh, a lot of young people 
people uh, uh, are probably watching us. Uh, they look up to you, and uh, many of them are in AIPC, and many of them are doing great work. You know, right now through you know through this throughout this pandemic, our own people have been uh, working. Uh, you know, and obviously, I know uh, you appreciate that. I know you'll uh, uh, you value all these efforts. I do as well. Uh, what is your message to uh, 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 you know young people around the country? Uh, and also, uh, uh, with, uh, our own AIPC fellows, what, what is the message that you want to send them? You know, as we, you know, I painted a rather grim picture, but I know that uh, that is not all. But I'm still optimistic. I still remain hopeful that we can do something. What is your view? What can what can young people do? What should they be looking uh, forward to? Do what do they have something to look forward? To? What what can you say to them uh, uh, today? Well, it's your country is what I would say too. You have a stake in its success. Uh, running away is not a satisfactory answer. Staying on or being indifferent and just confining yourself to your own immediate circle is an opt-out, is, is a cop-out, I beg your pardon. Uh, what you need to do, it seems to me as a young person, is to say, this is my country. I have a stake in making it better and I'm going to do my very best to ensure that I give the best I have to offer to create a better India. Uh, and certainly, it's our job to provide forums like the All India Professionals Congress in which young people can do that, in which they can find themselves, where they can express their ideas. Today, you and I have been doing much of the talking, but in most of our AIPC events, we encourage the, the fellows, particularly at the chapter levels, and state levels, to talk, to express some, uh, their ideas, to come up with initiatives that can then be fed up the party structure. It seems to me that every young person uh, does have skin in the game. And also the younger you are, the less you have to lose because if things go wrong and you end up with egg on your face, you can wipe it off and pick yourself up with lessons learned and go on later in life. Um, so my view is young people, we need you. We need your enthusiasm, your energy, your risk taking, your smarts uh, and your, uh, your commitment. So. Stay with us and, and work for India. With that, Shashi, with that positive, positive message to our young people, I thank you. I know you're tired. I know it's uh, been uh, not the easiest uh, for you, but uh, but uh, as always, you're you're a good sport. And thanks for doing this. And uh, you know, our team here uh, is with us, and uh, uh, nothing is possible before, without uh, this team. Sorry, just before we, <laughs> we do that, I wanted to. I wanted to just make uh, one point, uh, Dr. Tharoor, uh, despite the fact that you're recovering from COVID, many people saw your message on Twitter. Can we just say on behalf of the entire team, thank you so much, sir, for making the effort and the time to talk to the entire, to, to, to talk to us and talk to our listeners and to our viewers. Really appreciate, as always, sir, you lead by example. I just want to ask you, Deputy Chairman, Chairman, for your thoughts on two things. Number one, all of the AIPC states, without exception, have been doing different kinds of things in terms of COVID-19 relief, physical distribution in Delhi, all kinds of services in the South, East, West, and North. To those AIPC fellows currently engaged in relief efforts, what message do you have to them? And could you talk a little bit before you go about, hello, doctor? Well, very briefly, I, 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 it's a pleasure for me to do this. I am feeling very tired. so. You can understand this. It's been a first major event, especially of this interactive kind. And, and it's, it's good to be able to push the envelope a bit and see yes. how much I can do. Uh, so I'm glad to have done it. Uh, secondly, as far as all those who joined us and who are doing such amazing work in terms of providing relief, thank you. Thank you is, a, is a, something we don't say often enough and we need to say it a lot because people have really gone out and done an amazing job everything in terms of providing uh, essential supplies, medicines where possible, help. We've worked, of course, with Youth Congress and others uh, on, on whatever relief methods we could offer. And I must say that um, we've been blessed that in different parts of the country, uh, people under the IPC banner made a big difference. As you mentioned at the beginning, Alan, a couple of our people who went out to deliver relief caught COVID themselves. And one young man, or two young men, I think, lost their lives in the process. So it's been a huge, huge effort, a huge sacrifice. And we, uh, we really feel uh, for, uh, for all of them. Um, and about Hello Doctor, this is a campaign 
using our professionals in the All India Professionals Congress to provide medical counseling to people with doubts, with questions, with problems. Uh, we have essentially a helpline. The number has been publicized. And Alan, if you have it handy, you can mention it. Uh, that number can be dialed and you will get people with a number of different specializations, including mental health counseling, for which many people have been feeling the need. Uh, and in, I think, two languages, English and Hindi, but possibly other languages are also available on request. We are really trying to leverage the medical professionals of AIPC and indeed some who are not yet in AIPC but who want to work with us on this to give help to those who need it at this terrible time. Hello, doctor. And thank you, doctor, as well. Uh, I have nothing really to add to uh, that excellent summary, except my own thanks to all of our uh, fellows who are just doing a great job, you know. Uh, but, you know, th th this is a time I truly believe that your country needs you. So this is no time to stop for us. I think that this is, this is, this is the time for us to, you know, double down on doing more work, uh, connecting with people, uh, talking about, uh, you know, sending out a positive message, uh, you know, like, like, you know, uh, we, we're seeing now, you know, um, may, you know, there is, there, there is, uh, you know, people are more receptive to uh, the message of the Congress Party, and and the reason for that is because we are trying to do the right things, and people understand that something is going wrong, somebody's trying to do the right thing, and we should appreciate that, and because you know that that's a that's a human instinct, and in that context. AIPC fellows, uh, you're doing a wonderful job. Thank you so much. And you're putting, you know, and you're, you're also at risk, right? When you go out, you distribute uh, uh, some supplies to people who need them desperately. You're doing your bit. And I think we need to keep doing that. And we need to keep uh, giving voice uh, to uh, the hundreds of millions of people who do not have uh, a voice uh, right now. We need to bring their issues to the fore. So I thank you. I thank this team. Uh, for making this possible. Please don't worry about uh, uh, technical problems and all that. These things happen. This is the first such event. So don't uh, don't get down on yourselves. I know sometimes you will. Sometimes you do. Uh, uh, so I thank you. I know, Sh I know Shashi appreciates all this. Uh, so thank you for thank giving you. us an opportunity. Well, thank you all very much, Honorable Bye. Deputy Chairman and Chairman. As Dr. Tharoor mentioned, Hello Doctor is a service brought to you by the Indian National Congress and our other partners, including the Indian Youth Congress, the Seva Dal, and the vast majority doctors were just interested in serving. If you require medical assistance, services are offered in Hindi and in English. The number is double nine eight three eight three six eight three eight. That's double nine eight three eight three six eight three eight. Nine to nine, 9 a.m. to nine p.m. in Hindi and English. Medical and mental health advisory services nationwide. Thank you to all those people who've joined us today. Thank you to our honourable chairman, our deputy chairman, Dr. Tharoor. As always, it's a pleasure to see you, to hear you. Honestly, hearing you, seeing you gives us hope. Salman, thank you. Bye. Assalamu alaikum to you and to all our colleagues. Have a great evening. If you have not been able to join the full conversation, you can go to the AIPC Facebook page and you can watch the entire conversation from beginning to end. If you'd like to join the All India Professionals Congress, yes. www.profcongress.com. It's a very simple one, two, three process. Once again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Again, on behalf of the team, we apologize for any technical difficulties. We are sure you it won't happen again. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Stay safe, stay apart, and God bless. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye-bye-bye.